Today's episode will touch on sensitive topics such as violence and sexual abuse. So if you are sensitive to this content, please listen at your own discretion. What is art without the muse? Many of Western art's most famous works are depictions of women. But who were these women? Do they have their own stories to share with the world? Hello and welcome to Art Muse, a podcast that aims to reshape the ways in which we interpret well-known works of art by paying dues to the women whose images have been immortalized, but whose names and stories have been wrongfully overlooked. While these women's faces are familiar to viewers around the world, their identities have been largely forgotten. Together, we will explore the important lives and legacy of the female muse and appreciate these works of art from a new perspective, through the eyes of the women whose image stares back at us. Is the muse in actuality just as, if not more, important than the artists themselves? And I'm your host, Grace Anna. Caravaggio is one of the world's most revered artists, the first painter of drama who shook the art world by using people of the street to model as the most important biblical figures. As your host, I almost never include personal anecdotes, but I feel this episode deserves one. I have studied Caravaggio for over a decade. I focused on him in my undergraduate studies, wrote my master's thesis on him. I even have his name tattooed on my wrists. And in all the books I read, the classes I took, the hours upon hours that I examined and wrote about his works, I never learned the name and story of Caravaggio's favorite model, the copper-haired and dark-eyed beauty that features in many of his best works. Today, I introduce you to Feline Melandroni, the woman whose story inspired the idea behind this podcast and forever change the way that I appreciate Caravaggio's paintings. We can find Felid in four of Caravaggio's works, Portrait of a Courtesan, Martha and Mary Magdalene, St. Catherine of Alexandria, and Judith beheading Holofernes. She was the most consistent model that Caravaggio ever used and became an important figure in his life. She could pose as St. Catherine one day and Judith the next, but Philide herself was just as fierce as the biblical heroine she modeled as. And in these works, we also see Philide, a fearlessly confident prostitute with a crooked hand and gaze that could pierce as sharply as a sword. But Philide's heart-shaped face and spunky character impressed more than just Caravaggio. By the time Philide modeled for Caravaggio, she had become one of Rome's most famous prostitutes, a rising star in the world of brothels, with the city's most powerful men as her clients. She even managed to win the heart of Giulio Strozzi, a member of Florence's most influential family after the Medicis, who was so in love with her that he asked for her hand in marriage. At the peak of her career, Philide was arguably the most sought-after woman in all of Rome. And despite her well-to-do clientele, Philide was just as rough-edged as Caravaggio himself. She could be found in the city's darkest drinking dens, wrecking havoc late at night with Rome's other notorious night creatures. Her story includes romance, violence, murder, and exile. But most of all, it is the story of an independent woman who was able to climb the ranks of Rome's social world and work her way from poverty to luxury through her own hard work and personal drive. Philide's appearance in Caravaggio's works coincided with the launch of the style he is best known for, the dark and violent scenes painted with such bravado that they continue to shock viewers today. Philide's spirited presence in these works was just as responsible for the development of Caravaggio's matured artistic voice as Caravaggio himself, and her role in informing his artistic practice deserves recognition. Without further ado, 
Let's dive in. Philippe Melandroni was born on January 8, 1581, in Siena, into a modest Sienese family. We do not have a ton of information on Philippe's childhood in Siena, nor what her family's occupation was. We do, however, know that her father, Ennia Melandroni, tragically passed away in 1593, when Philippe was only 12 years old. Her father's death left her family in a precarious financial position, and her mother, Cinzia Melandroni, made the tough decision to uproot the family and move to Rome, where Philippe's aunt worked as a tavern waitress. And so, Philippe made her way to Rome with her mother and her brother Silvio. They shared their travel coach with another Sienese widow, Sibylla Bianchini, and her two children, Alessandria and Anna. Anna was roughly the same age as Philippe, and the two became fast friends. What was Philippe thinking about as she journeyed away from the only home she had ever known? to the infamous city of Rome. Was she feeling the weight of her father's death? Was she scared to leave the streets of her childhood? Or was a part of her excited, exhilarated by the promise of a new beginning? Did she and Anna whisper late into the night with anticipation? When they arrived in Rome on a rainy day that February, the two families decided to move in together, sharing a house on Via dell'Armata. The house was situated near the Church of St. Catherine, the patron saint of Siena, which we can imagine provided a sense of familiarity and comfort. Little did Philippe know that a few years later, she would pose as St. Catherine for one of Rome's up-and-coming artists, Caravaggio. The city of Rome was not for the faint-hearted, and Philippe and Anna's mothers soon realized that the best way to earn money for the families was by putting their daughters to work as prostitutes. In April of 1594, when Philippe was only 13 years old, she was arrested with Anna for being out past curfew, presumably already working the streets, a police record that still exists today. We can only imagine how quickly Philippe had to grow up upon her arrival in Rome. Becoming a sex worker at such a young age in one of the roughest cities in the world naturally hardened Philippe. But while most people in her position might have felt crushed by the circumstances they'd found themselves in, Philippe began to thrive. And it soon became clear that Rome's rough streets were no match for Philippe's wild spirit. By 1597, at the age of 16, Philippe's career as a prostitute had taken off. Although Philippe was undoubtedly rough around the edges, she was also cultured. Her name, named after a character from a widely read Renaissance poem, gave her an elegant and classy edge, distinguishing her from her fellow ladies of the night. She quickly climbed the ranks from prostitute to courtesan and won herself a protector. Because prostitution was illegal and came with its severe punishment, a protector could act as a shield against law enforcement and allow a freedom and ease other sex workers didn't have. By the time Philippe met Caravaggio in 1599, she was 18 years old and at the height of her career. She had reached the highest class of courtesans and engaged with some of Rome's most important men. So it is with some mystery that Caravaggio, a relatively unknown painter just beginning his artistic career, became acquainted with Philippe and managed to have her pose for several of his works. It's possible that Caravaggio was a client himself or met Philippe through one of his patrons, the notable Italian banker Vincenzo Gustiniani, who was also one of Philippe's more significant clients. Caravaggio may have also met Philippe through other prostitutes who modeled for him. In fact, it's speculated that Anna, Philippe's oldest friend, was the model in Caravaggio's The Penitent Magdalene. Was Caravaggio a client of Philippe's? Did they become lovers? <laughs> 
Friends? Did they rough around the streets of Rome after hours together, causing trouble? Whatever the circumstances of their meeting and start to their relationship, Philide soon became Caravaggio's most beloved model and an important presence in his life. Many of Caravaggio's best works from this period, and in fact the works that launched his career as a leading painter in Rome, feature Philide. Her copper hair and penetrating stare became staple features of these works, as did the theme of strong women. Whether posed as herself or a biblical figure, Philide played the heroine, strong and independent, confidently stealing the spotlight against Caravaggio's shadowed interiors. The first work of Caravaggio's we find Philide in, and the only where she is without historical guise, is his portrait of a courtesan. Painted in 1598, when Philide was just 18 years old, we see a self-assured and well-dressed woman holding jasmine blossoms to her breast and unafraid to meet our gaze. Her rich costume, pearl earrings, elegant bracelet, and stylish dress are all items we can assume Philide herself owned, perhaps lavish gifts she had received from happy clients, and we can feel both her pride and delight over her items of luxury. Philide is unquestionably attractive. In fact, the portrait was so admired that it inspired contemporary poetry. One poem of the time reading, Only an angel could portray you, the lovely Phyllis, creating your lovely face because you are an angel from paradise. But the portrait is also intensely real. It is Philide, dangerously beautiful, with a fierce intensity that both entices and frightens at once. It was extremely rare for Caravaggio to paint portraits of individuals, let alone of a courtesan. Philide impressed Caravaggio enough to be a subject of only a handful of portraits he made over his entire career. She evidently impressed a patron enough to commission it. The portrait was painted for Giulio Strozzi, a Florentine aristocrat and poet from one of the most powerful Florentine dynasties. Giulio fell passionately in love with Philide, further accentuating her unparalleled desirability, winning the hearts of the Italian elite. And in fact, Strozzi so admired Philide that he lent her the portrait to keep in her own home. We can only imagine the surge of pride that Philide felt each and every time she met her own eye. She had her own portrait, painted by one of Rome's rising painters and commissioned by one of the most notable men. Painted the same year, we find Philide again in Martha and Mary Magdalene. This was the first devotional work to feature Philide and the first time she posed as a biblical figure. The painting depicts Mary Magdalene and her sister Martha who urges Mary Magdalene to leave behind her career as a prostitute and be saved. Mary considers Martha's words with contemplation, and while Caravaggio includes details that allude to Mary's eventual conversion, like the orange blossom she holds representing purity and the ring on her wedding finger signifying her spiritual marriage to Christ, her expression seems to suggest that she is not yet fully convinced. And it is here that we find Philide, a well-known and recognizable prostitute of her day, posing as Mary Magdalene, as she ponders the choice presented to her. There is a convergence of identities, Philide as Mary Magdalene and Mary Magdalene as Philide. The same hand that bears the ring signifying Mary Magdalene's marriage to Christ is clearly deformed, her finger dissociated and sticking out at a jarring angle. It is undoubtedly Philide's own hand, a deformity that very likely resulted from a scuffle on the street, a detail Caravaggio deliberately kept in so that Philide's identity was unmistakable. Philide, who showed no signs of remorse over her success as a prostitute, seems at first miscast. But we know from an inventory of her household items taken many years later that Philide herself owned a painting of Mary Magdalene, 
What was Philippe thinking about as she posed as the famed reformed prostitute? Did she relate to Mary Magdalene and feel their likeness? Did any part of her wish to also leave her life behind and instead turn to faith? Or did Philippe enjoy with Caravaggio the almost humorous irony that she, of all people, would pose as Mary Magdalene? Did she smile as her crooked finger wore Mary Magdalene's ring, knowing that she, Philippe, could never be convinced of such a thing? Philid posed as saint again that same year, this time modeling as St. Catherine of Alexandria. As per the biblical story, St. Catherine was an extremely bright and educated young woman who protested the prosecution of Christians by the Romans and was subsequently imprisoned and sentenced to death. She was ordered to be killed with a spiked wheel, but God intervened and broke the wheel before she could be killed. Instead, the Romans took a sword and executed her by blade. In Caravaggio's version, we see many typical salutes to St. Catherine's story. The martyr's palm lies at her feet. The red cushion she kneels on signifies her noble birth, the broken spiked wheel to her side, and the sword she was eventually executed with. And yet, Caravaggio presents a St. Catherine like never before seen. Set within a dark and bare interior, Catherine stares not at heaven, but directly at us as she toys with her weapon of death. The mood is intimate, and the work vibrates with an almost violent sexuality. In Catherine's hands is not a sword of biblical times, but a contemporary and delicate rapier. She seductively strokes the rapier's pommel and lightly runs her hands over its blade. She leans against the broken wheel with such closeness that the weapon of death could pass as lover. Her face is blushed, and her eyes permeate with an excitement, as if she is daring us to make our move, teasing us with her effortless sexual prowess. And who better to capture this interplay between violence and sexuality, sainthood and sin, than Philide? Catherine is unmistakably Philide. We see the slight deformity of Philide's finger, which Caravaggio again decided to include. Is this a painting of St. Catherine, or is it a portrait of an emotionally and sexually confident courtesan? The line is blurred, and Catherine and Philide's identities dance with one another before our eyes. In this way, Caravaggio has transformed Catherine into a real contemporary woman a courtesan famous on the streets of Rome for her rough edge and irresistible beauty, a woman who was in no way afraid to hold her own sword. But of course, these were just the warm-up. Soon after, Caravaggio and Philide would team up once more to bring the painting that would forever change Caravaggio's career, and one of the bloodiest and glorious paintings in the history of Western art. Judith Beheading Holofernes. If you don't know the story of Judith, you're in for a treat. Judith, a Jewish widow whose husband and family had been killed by the Assyrians, snuck into the Assyrian military camp and entered the tent of the army general Holofernes. Upon entering, she began to seduce Holofernes, who immediately fell for her charm. As part of her seduction, she suggested they drink wine until Holofernes became heavily intoxicated. After he stumbled to his bed, expecting Judith to follow, Judith seized Holofernes' sword and decapitated him, taking his head back with her as a victory token and effectively saving the Jewish people. Much like David and Goliath, Judith has been celebrated as a heroine representing the triumph of virtue over vice, the underdog claiming victory over tyranny. She is the personification of both justice and fortitude. Despite her Jewish origins, Christians also celebrated Judith, and she became a popular subject for artists dating back to the Middle Ages. But while typical depictions of Judith showed her passively holding the sword and head of Holofernes, Caravaggio reminds us that at its core, this is a story of a woman beheading a man with his own sword. (laughs) 
and his painting was the first to portray Judith in the midst of her bloody act. There is nothing passive about Caravaggio's Judith. Rather, she is a woman exercising her own strength and bravery and seeking her own rightful revenge. We see Judith, face full of concentration, holding Holofernes' hair with her left hand and severing his head with her right hand. As Judith plunges his sword through his own neck, Holofernes screams and blood spurts into the air with ferocity. Caravaggio leaves none of the violence left to our imagination, but shows us the gruesome act with such reality that the painting continues to shock viewers today. Once again, Caravaggio brings this biblical scene into his present-day world. Judith is not of biblical times, but is a contemporary Roman woman. And who else could model with such fierceness and attitude but Felide Melandroni? We find Felide, a sword in her hand, brow damp with sweat, slicing through a man's neck with no remorse, and, in fact, perhaps instead with some enjoyment. If you look closely at Felide's chest, her nipples are visibly erect, giving the painting a sexual undertone. Is this Judith? Or is this Felide playing out a fantasy? After all, we can imagine that Felide had come across her fair share of power-hungry men. What was Felide thinking about as she sliced a sword through Holofernes' neck? Did her erect nipples indicate a bodily excitement that coursed through her? Might she have fantasized about murdering one of the many clients who may have crossed a line? That she could chop off their own head, or perhaps their manhood, as they laid their vulnerable bodies across her bed. Was there anyone that she would have liked to behead, too? In Caravaggio's painting, the tent becomes a brothel, the bed a prostitute's bed, Judith a ruthless courtesan. Caravaggio has placed Judith in the violent world in which he and Felide lived, but this time, Felide had nothing holding her back from taking the head of her assailant. And in fact, Caravaggio's painting may have held more than one revenge fantasy. The painting was made in close proximity to a high-profile case that had left Rome a buzz. Beatrice Cenci, a young woman at the age of 16, was publicly beheaded in Rome for the murder of her father. Her father was an important nobleman from one of the most powerful families in Rome, but Beatrice had good reason to have murdered her father. She and her stepmother, Lucrezia, had suffered years of abuse from him, repeatedly raping and assaulting them. At one point, he imprisoned them in a castle he owned, where he treated them with unspeakable brutality. With the help of her brother, Beatrice planned her father's murder, not only to seek revenge, but to put an end to the continued abuse she had endured for years. When they had their chance, Beatrice, her brother, and Lucrezia threw Beatrice's father's body from a balcony to make his death appear as an accident. But because her father was a highly influential member of Roman society, his death was heavily investigated, and Beatrice and her family were arrested for murder. She eventually confessed after being imprisoned and tortured. Beatrice, her stepmother Lucrezia, and her brother Giacomo were all publicly executed in September of 1599, beheaded for all of Rome to see. The case was highly controversial, and the people of Rome overwhelmingly sided with Beatrice, who they had felt had been unfairly punished. Weeping onlookers crowded the streets as they stood to watch Beatrice's death. Despite the public support, Beatrice's execution was ordered by Pope Clement VIII and backed by the Roman elite. Beatrice was a woman crushed by an unforgiving regime that would always work against her. She was up against a force so great, not unlike Judith, as she entered the mighty Holofernes tent. It is safe to assume that both Caravaggio and Felide would have been in the crowd on the day of Beatrice's execution. Painted within a year of Beatrice's execution, 
Judith beheading Holofernes must have been Caravaggio and Felide's response to the injustice that they had bore witness to. Except this time, the outcome was very different. While Beatrice had no chance against Rome's patriarchal tyranny, Felide seeks revenge on her behalf, as she plunges a sword into the neck of a violent man. Caravaggio justifies and celebrates the revenge that Beatrice took upon her father and transforms her from beheaded to beheader. As Felide slices through Holofernes' neck, she challenges the patriarchal oppression that Beatrice, Felide, and women through the dawn of time have had to endure. Felide herself was certainly no stranger to violence, and while she may have never sliced a man's neck, she did slice other body parts. Throughout the years that Caravaggio painted Felide, she had many run-ins with the law, and not just over prostitution. Like Caravaggio, Felide was a creature of the rough streets of Rome and would have been well immersed in its violence and debauchery. There are several court records that still exist today that outline Felide's rebellious and at times vicious nature. These incidents bring new life to her role in Caravaggio's paintings, and we can better imagine that as she stroked a sword as Catherine and decapitated Holofernes as Judith, she felt right at home in the violent worlds that Caravaggio cast her in. The first incident on record dates to 1599, within the same fruitful period that Caravaggio painted Felide into several canvases. As the incident details, the police arrived at Felide's house on an evening in February 1599, when neighbors complained of a loud and misbehaving party, and that the men attending were armed with illegal weapons. Word must have gotten out that the police had been called, because when they arrived at Felide's house, she was found with only three men, one of which was her pimp, Renuccio Tomassoni. Both Felide and Tomassoni were arrested and taken into custody. We can only imagine what kind of party a woman like Felide would have hosted, and her wild spirit must have been alive with amusement. That same year, Felide was arrested again for possession of an illegal weapon, one that Renuccio likely gave her. We can picture her, like Catherine, holding onto her weapon with a sense of ease, as if daring someone to take it away from her. But the real trouble came in 1600, just after Caravaggio painted Felide as Judith beheading Holofernes. Except this time, the violence turned from fantasy to reality. On December 4th, 1600, when Felide was only 19 years old, she was accused of assault by another courtesan named Prudenza. Prudenza herself was no angel. She had been recently arrested for throwing a brick at a governmental agent. This gives us a sense of the rough-edged crowd that ran in Felide's circle. Both Felide and Prudenza worked for Renuccio Tomassoni, and evidently had intimate relationships with him. One morning, Felide barged into Renuccio's house, and when she found Prudenza in bed with him, began attacking Prudenza with a knife. A friend of Renuccio who was at his house at this time bore witness to the event. As he recounted in court, Renuccio was in bed together with a woman named Prudenza Zacchia, and a woman named Felide came into the house and ran upstairs. And as soon as she saw Prudenza, she began saying, Ah, you slag, you baggage, there you are. And at the time, she ran to the table and took a knife and went to the said Prudenza, saying, I'm going to scar you everywhere. As Prudenza herself recalled in court, she came at me in every way and gave me blows and tore off a lot of my hair. Then she left. But the trouble had only just begun. Later that day, Felide went to Prudenza's house looking for her. Felide allegedly kicked Prudenza's mother out of the way and began attacking Prudenza with her knife again. As Prudenza continued, Felide came at me with a knife to disfigure me and she hauled me up by the mouth to give me a scar. I defended myself with my hand, which she cut on the wrist and wounded me 
After leaving, Philide waited in the street to have another go at Prudenza, and would have continued to attack her had a gentleman not broken up their fight. Philide ran to her window, and as per witnesses, shouted down at Prudenza, You scum! You strumpet! I wounded you in the hand, but I wanted to get you in the kisser. Don't worry, I'll be back. Philide made her threats public. The street, her theater, where all could hear her roar, her mightiest. Philide was evidently threatening to disfigure Prudenza's face the next time she got her hands on her, which was actually a serious and common offense at the time. Called a sfregio, or a facial scar, it not only disfigured someone's facial features, but was a symbol of dishonor and shame, a permanent marker on someone's reputation. Little side fact, it was so common that even the Baroque sculptor Bernini ordered a sfregio on one of his lovers who had betrayed him. For Prudenza, a scarred face would have meant the end of her career as a street worker and made her damaged goods. But Feline knew how to taunt her, slice her in the right places, so that a sfregio remained a threat that could hang over Prudenza's head. Feline remained in full control, and the case ultimately did not result in any punishment. Feline was at the peak of her career as the leading courtesan of Rome's most powerful men, and she wasn't going to risk it for anything, even the glory of forever damaging Prudenza's reputation. Felide and Prudenza were fighting over the attention and affections of Renuccio Tamassoni with violent passion. We know that they both worked for Renuccio and that he ran a circle of prostitution in which he took a portion of their earnings. He also clearly had sexual relationships with some of these women and very strong emotional ties, as we know Felide's connection to Renuccio remained strong for years. There are endless surviving records in which Renuccio appears for various offenses, and he was almost constantly having run-ins with the law. But Renuccio also had familial ties to one of the most powerful dynasties in Rome, the Farnese family, and subsequently had a protection that allowed him to escape severe punishment. But while Renuccio may have escaped legal prosecution, in the end, he couldn't escape the wrath of Caravaggio. Renuccio and Caravaggio assumably met through the world of brothels, and of course had the shared connection of Felide Melandroni, whom both men were close to. Whether it was Renuccio's territorialism over Felide, or a clashing of both of their strong, violent personalities, Renuccio and Caravaggio quickly became sworn enemies. After a few years of insults and confrontation, Caravaggio and Renuccio eventually decided to resolve their differences once and for all in a pre-planned duel, set to take place at a tennis court. On May 28, 1606, Caravaggio and Renuccio, both with their right-hand men, faced off in a duel. The duel quickly turned bloody. Caravaggio was wounded in the head, but managed to slice Renuccio near his genitals, and puncture his femoral artery. While Caravaggio was likely trying to do a sfregio of sorts on Renuccio's man parts, the punctured artery caused a fatal amount of blood loss. As Caravaggio and his men fled from the scene, Renuccio bled to death and died soon after. Is it possible that Caravaggio and Renuccio were fighting over Felide? The fact that Caravaggio targeted Renuccio's private parts could very well indicate that they were fighting over a woman. Did Felide know about the duel ahead of time? Did she hide in those early hours in the morning and watch as Caravaggio plunged a sword in Renuccio's groin? How did she feel that the man who painted her into his masterpieces had just murdered the man she worked for, who was also her friend and lover? We can only imagine the dismay that Felide must have felt that her worlds collided in such a bloody and fatal way. To make matters worse, Caravaggio fled Rome just a few days after the murder to escape facing legal punishment 
likely a beheading, for the murder of Renuccio, never to return again. Philide more than likely never got to say goodbye to him. With her pimp and dear friend dead, and the man who killed him, whom she had worked with on some of the greatest works the world has ever seen, escaped from Rome with a reward on his head, Philide must have felt incredibly alone. And in fact, a few years later, Philide faced her own exile. Through the years, her lover Giulio Strozzi, the man who had commissioned Caravaggio to paint her portrait, was falling deeper and deeper in love with Philide. His love became so intense that in 1612, he asked Philide to marry him. This was an almost unheard of scenario. A man of one of the highest ranking families in Italy wishing to marry a prostitute. His family became increasingly concerned, and before Philide and Giulio could officially marry, the Strozzi's exiled Philide from Rome. Where did Philide go in the two years that she was banned from Rome? Did she miss Giulio? Did she miss Rome? Was she furious? Or did part of her feel victorious? that a family of such power could be so threatened by a sole courtesan that they had to ban her from the entire city. We do not know where Philide spent her time in exile, but we do know that when she moved back to Rome two years later, she returned with considerate wealth, perhaps paid off by the Strozzi's, and perhaps also a testament to the great heights that Philide had climbed as a successful sex worker. Philide lived out her later years more than comfortably. She was able to buy her own house on one of Rome's most prestigious streets. We know from an inventory taken at her death that her house was lavishly decorated. Her main reception floors were covered with Turkish carpets, decorated with gilded leather panels, and had a large table for guests with leather-covered chairs. Her bedroom had a gold-gilded bed with a green fabric canopy, and she had a chest full of luxury clothing. She owned several books, beautiful vases, pearl necklaces, and gold pendants. We also know that she owned some art. She owned a painting of the Nativity, a painting of the Virgin Mary, and one of the penitent Magdalene, a saint she may have felt an increasing kinship with through her later years. And, of course, she had her portrait by Caravaggio, which she kept as her most important possession until her death. Though we do not have much information on Philide in her final years in Rome, we can only imagine how proud she must have been of how far she had come from her early days on Rome's dark streets. That she had climbed massive heights and had built for herself a home filled with items of beauty and luxury that it was her own personal charm, street-savvy spunk, and hard work that had gotten her here, that like Judith, she had seduced and fooled many a men and was the heroine of her own story. Tragically, during the summer of 1618, Philide became fatally ill with a venereal disease. As Philide's death approached, she began to donate to religious institutions dedicated to the Virgin Mary, presumably to ensure her soul could be saved after her death. She also put aside one-fifth of her entire estate to be given to convertiles, former prostitutes who had converted to Christianity. This may indicate that Philide herself said goodbye to her many successful years as a courtesan and turned to faith in her later years. In the end, perhaps Philide wasn't so different from Mary Magdalene after all. Philide Melandroni passed away on July 3, 1618, at the age of 37. Her life was unfairly cut short, and we can only imagine the lavish, exciting life she would have lived out had she been given the chance. Though there is a lack of information regarding much of Philide's life, her last will and testament have survived and can be read today, over 400 years later providing a rare insight into the personal desires of Philide herself. Soon after her death, an inventory of her household was made, 
recording all of the valuable items she amassed over her short but full life. In her will, Felide asked that her property be sold and the proceeds split between her legatees of choice. But there was one possession that she did not want sold and instead returned to a specific person, her portrait by Caravaggio. As her will states, she has in her house a painting or portrait by the hand of Michelangelo da Caravaggio that belongs to Giulio Strozzi. She wishes it be restored and consigned to Sir Giulio. It's clear that her portrait was the most precious possession she had and that she wanted to be sure that it was returned to its rightful owner. Feline may have also taken comfort in the fact that though she was no longer with us, her image would continue to be protected by the man who had protected her best in life, that her face would still be admired and loved. Though her will specified that she be buried in her parish church, and despite her having given a significant amount of money to organizations of faith, the church refused to give her a Christian burial. In another injustice to Felide's legacy, her portrait, which had kept her company through her life and eventually made its way to the Kaiser Frederick Museum in Berlin, was destroyed by bombings during World War II. And we are left with only photographs of the work. Instead, her legacy lives on in the surviving paintings that Caravaggio forever captured her in, which keep alive her wildly free spirit. Felide was transformed into Mary Magdalene, St. Catherine, and Judith, but never completely. And in these works, we also see the spunky, fearless, crooked-handed courtesan who turned even the most powerful men of Rome weak at the knees. It was not just Caravaggio's chiaroscuro that launched his career as the painter of drama, but also Felide's presence. Once he painted Felide, all of his future works were charged with a spark as fierce as her untamed character. And he knew there was no going back. I hope you enjoyed this episode on Felide Melandroni. I've included images, resources, and suggestions for further reading on the Art Muse website and Instagram. Art Muse is produced by Kula Production Company. Today's episode was written by me, your host, Grace Anna. Stay tuned as I continue to share the stories of the women behind some of the world's most important works of art. Until next time, bye for now.